On completion of the clinical stage of jaw registration, the wax occlusal rims are returned to the laboratory in order to undertake the next technical stage and complete dench construction. The rims will normally arrive in the laboratory assembled together on the casts, displaying the patient's retruded jaw relationship. Other vital information has also been recorded and is visible here on the labial surface of the rims. This information consists of the center or midline, the two canine lines, and the high lip line or smile line. The upper and lower rims are positively located in the jaw relationship by two V-shaped grooves cut into the occlusal surface of the maxillary rim. Positive impressions of the grooves are provided by wedges of wax fixed to the lower rim. Both rims should fit together without ambiguity. Care must be taken to ensure that there is no rim to cast or cast to cast interference that prevents the base plates from seating accurately onto their respective casts. Both registration and casts will be mounted onto a semi-adjustable articulator. This device is capable of simulating most of the movements made by the patient's mandible. Let us take a closer look at the articulator in question. It is capable of reproducing all of the patient's basic mandibular movements, such as protrusive movement, lateral excursion, and opening and closing. In contrast to the patient, the upper maxillary element of the articulator moves to these movements. This is for convenience and does not detract from the accuracy of reproduction of jaw movements. Before mounting, the upper rim and cast is separated from the lower and a series of grooves are cut into the base to provide mechanical retention between the cast and the articulating plaster. The upper rim and casts are positioned onto the mounting table of the articulator and held in position with a piece of soft carding wax. The centre line of the rim is positioned so that its midline is coincident with the centre of the table. The rim is then held in position with two small strips of wax. The cast is then carefully removed from the rim and placed into a bowl of cold water to soak for two minutes. It is then positioned back onto the rim and checked to ensure accurate seating. It is also important to ensure that adequate space between the base of the cast and the upper member of the articulator has been provided for the mounting plaster. A mixture of 100 grams of plaster to 50 cc's of water in a ratio of 2 to 1 is made and applied to the base of the cast.
A small amount of plaster is also placed onto the mounting plate. The upper member of the articulator is then very carefully closed. Notice also that the incisal guidance post must be in contact with the incisal guidance table. The gross excess of plaster is then removed with a plaster knife before the residual mass reaches its initial set. After approximately three to four minutes, the plaster is strong enough to permit the next phase in the process to proceed. The mounting table has now served its purpose and is removed from the articulator. A mounting plate, identical to that of the upper, is then screwed down tightly into place. The process for mounting the lower cast is identical to that of the upper, that is, the cast is soaked and retention grooves are cut into its base. Again, the lower rim is placed onto the cast and checked for accurate seating before the rim is related against the upper. Both occlusal rims are then sealed down onto their respective casts. The occlusal edges are also united with molten wax to prevent accidental movement and loss of the recorded jaw relationship. The mounting process is virtually identical to that of the upper mounting procedure. The plaster is placed onto the cast and mounting table before the articulator is closed. Again, both incisal guidance post and table must be in definite contact.
Extraneous plaster is then removed before initial setting takes place. The upper and lower mounting plasters are smoothed with a small piece of wet or dry paper under running water. A finish similar to this should be achieved. Note also that contact between the incisal guidance table has been maintained. Any discrepancy here would result in an increase in occlusal vertical height and hence loss of freeway space. We now see the result of this mounting procedure whereby the upper and lower casts have been fixed into the patient's jaw relationship which has been predetermined clinically. This now becomes the laboratory analogue of the patient's temporomandibular joints and upper and lower jaws, separated by the desired occlusal vertical dimension. We are now ready to begin the next stage of denture construction, which involves the fabrication of a set of wax trial dentures.